So you want to write a video essay, but every time you try to start, you feel like you just aren't getting anywhere. There has to be a better way. Introducing Zoe B's essay o -Matic. With the essay o -Matic, you too can write flawless video essays in only eight easy to follow steps. For the low, low payment of zero dollars, this is literally free, you can finally fulfill your dreams of being the greatest video essayist of all time. Didn't like that. So how can you accomplish this incredible feat? With the essay o -Matic's patented top eight list format, simply follow these eight easy steps and you will become the next great video essayist. Results not guaranteed. First, write what you know. So for this step, what we're going to do. Okay, I'm not gonna do that voice for this whole list. I don't want that, you don't want that, nobody wants that, so I'm not gonna do it. Also, now that I am back to being Zoe me, uh, please remember that this list isn't definitive or comprehensive or exhaustive. It is just the advice of a writing teacher and content creator. So take all of these points with lots and lots of salt. Anyway, <laughs> number one is writing what you know. Now, I know that this is a common piece of writing advice that often is misunderstood, but what I mean in this case is that when you're coming up with ideas for video essays, you should focus on topics in which you have knowledge, experience, or authority. This is because you need to give people a reason to watch your videos. You need to give them a reason to choose your video over someone else's, a reason to listen to you, a reason to trust you. Philosophy Tube and ContraPoints both studied philosophy. Veritasium was a science educator before becoming a YouTuber, and Alexa Dunn has written and published several books. In my case, I talk about reading, writing, rhetoric, and education because I have studied and taught all those things. We watch these videos because we know that the creators have experience, and in some cases expertise, in these subjects. They talk about philosophy and science and writing because it's what they know. It's what they've studied. It's their craft that they have honed over the years. And you also don't have to have a degree in the thing you're talking about, and you don't have to flash your credentials every time you open your mouth. But as far as idea generation goes, thinking about what you know and what makes you a unique voice in this ocean of content is a good first place to start. Now, that's not to say that you can never cover anything outside your wheelhouse. Doing research and learning new things and sharing that new knowledge with people is great, but writing what you do know is just a good starting point. Step two is focus. So you've decided that since you have a degree or experience in history, that you want to write a video somehow relating to capitalism or the history of neoliberalism or something like that. You cannot fit a comprehensive takedown of capitalism in a 25-minute video, or a 60-minute video, or even a 90-minute video. You just can't. Now, take the word capitalism and replace it with any other big economic or philosophical or cultural comment concept. That's the word. All these things are way too big to talk about in broad, all-encompassing ways. So what you should do instead is take that big concept and either A, apply it to something more specific, B, only look at very specific parts of that big thing, or C, just write a book. Video essays are not the medium for you, bud. <laughs> like Folding Ideas video, Jamie Oliver's War on Nuggets. This video is about a specific man and some specific nugs, but it's also about the entire concept of food and class. It's about how we often think of food in terms of clean and dirty. But the only reason that we can understand these giant issues is because they are packaged in the small, digestible nugget of nuggets. <laughs> Another good example of this is H. Bomberguy's video, Vaccines, A Measured Response. In this video, it seems like he's going to destroy the entire anti-vax movement, but that's quite a bit, even for him, and I think that he knew that that would be way more than he could handle. So what he did instead was focus on the specific study that is cited as the core text of the anti-vax movement. 
By debunking this one text, by looking at this text and its author, and by highlighting the wild and cruel and immoral practices associated with it, H-bomb was able to talk about the core of the anti-vax movement without biting off more than he could chew. All right, I think that I have said the word anti-vax enough. Let's not get demonetized. But Snowy, philosophy tube and contrapoints make videos about big, big concepts all the time. That's a valid point. But three things. Number one, no, they don't. <laughs> they do have videos that are titled like they're about these big, vague concepts, but most of the time, the actual videos themselves are way more focused than they appear. Number two, yeah, in some cases, they do do that. But that means that they've, they've got it covered. They have that corner of the market. And three, once you have a million subscribers, you can do whatever you want and you'll get views. This video is not about them. <laughs> they, don't, they don't need to watch a video from somebody with 130,000 subscribers telling them how to make video essays. I think they've, they've got it covered. <laughs> so it's not that you can't talk about big concepts at all. It's just that you need to take the big concepts and do something with them. Make them smaller and more manageable. Apply them to specific, concrete, everyday things. If you think that the thing you're talking about could be turned into a whole full semester college class, it's probably too big. So take it, make it more specific, focus it down into its essential parts, and then you can tackle it. Now, step three is a little bit harder because with this one, you need to do something new. So let's say that you've taken this history idea and distilled it down to be about how profit motives have affected art, specifically video games. And then maybe you want to focus that down even more and look specifically at loot boxes. Great. Awesome idea. Love it. Except it's been done before. Like, a lot. And if you make a video about it, what else can you add? Do you have a unique perspective? Have things changed since those other videos were posted? Do you think that those other videos got something wrong or overlooked something and so you want to correct them or fill in those gaps? All of those are great reasons to cover already discussed topics. But otherwise, you should probably talk about something else. Unless you're doing it as like a vanity project, because <laughs> we all need to do those sometimes. Did I need to make a takedown of a PragerU video? Was it necessary for the public? But was it fun and gratifying junk food in video format? Hell yeah, it was. <laughs> So what does new look like? Well, new is a hard thing to look at because as soon as someone makes something new, that thing stops being new. But one creator that does a good job of finding new stuff is Jacob Geller. He finds topics that most of us would just never think about. Like this video where he talks about how schools in the US are being constructed with school shootings in mind. That is wild. Nobody is talking about that. But finding new ideas can be a little daunting, so if you're struggling to find totally new things, something you can do instead is find a new angle from which to look at an old thing. Like Sean's video on the death penalty. Where most arguments for or against capital punishment come at it from either a moral angle or an efficacy angle, his video looks at it from a political angle. Instead of asking, is capital punishment right, or is capital punishment effective, he asks, should the government be given the power to decide who lives and dies? Come on, good boy. Come up here, let me love you. Don't run away. Ooh, you're so big. You can also look at these well-hashed topics with new depth. Like how Action Button does video game reviews, something that we really don't need any more of on the internet. Like, please stop making video game reviews. We have enough of those. But what he does that makes his stand out is that they're all like three hours long and go into the subject's cultural and historical legacy. Having a good time. Now, this doesn't mean that you can never discuss topics that bigger or more popular channels have discussed. It just means that you should find a new angle, a unique perspective, something that makes your video stand out. I know that you have something unique to say, you just need to figure out what it is.
Moving on to step four. Now that you've found your idea and you know that your idea is worth saying, now you can actually start writing. Yeah, you get almost halfway into this list before you even start putting words on a page. I'm a writing teacher, I promise you this is how the writing process works. <laughs> so you have this idea, and now you want to start writing. Well, before you do that, we will get to the writing, I promise. But before you do that, I want you to stop, take this nebulous idea that's in your brain, and ask yourself, what is it that I want people to know or feel after having watched my video? And then write down your answer to that question. And I'm gonna do the teacher thing where I ask you to write it down in complete sentences, but trust me, it's for a good reason. Because this statement, what we in the biz call a thesis statement, is the most important sentence in your whole script. And you're probably not even gonna say it out loud. What you're doing with this sentence is distilling down this whole idea into a single sentence, or more likely a couple sentences, that is a concentrated version of your entire still unwritten script. And the reason why you should write this first is because it gives you a goal. It gives you a kernel to grow the rest of your essay from. You latch onto this centerpiece, this cornerstone, and then build the rest of your essay around it. And your kernel should also be geared toward your audience. Who is it that you are hoping to reach? Are you hoping to change minds, reinforce beliefs, tear down existing frameworks and build up new paradigms? Is it just indulgent? Because that's okay too. <laughs> and Desmond wants to let in because he doesn't know what he desires in his heart of hearts. Come on. You need to have an idea of who your audience is because that will shape how the rest of your essay looks. Because what works for one audience doesn't necessarily work for another audience. And not being aware of your audience can lead to echo chambers and not actually changing minds when you had hoped to. So you always need to be aware of who your audience is when you make your kernel. What? What? I'm talking about kernels and I can hear my husband making popcorn downstairs. <laughs> Is it, is it picking up on the mic? He knows I'm filming. I don't know why he's making literally like the loudest food. <laughs> but it sounds like it's almost done. Hopefully. <sighs> okay. But... There's always a but. That doesn't mean that your kernel is forever. You're free to change it at any point. And sometimes you should change it. If you find new ideas while doing research, or if you decide to focus on a slightly different angle, then your kernel should change along with those ideas. Once you have your kernel, that's when you can start to do some research and put lots of words on the page. And this process, the actual nitty gritty of research and the mechanical act of writing, those are topics that could be their own video, and I'm not going to talk about them here. This video is about the shape and flavor of video essays, not a foolproof formula for writing them. This isn't about exactly what you should do, it's about the why that underpins how video essays work. Your next step begins with a story. See, our wonderful editor here on the channel is Charlie Flowers, but before he was a video editor, he was in a punk band. He is very cool. He is very much cooler than me. <laughs> anyway, Charlie told me that he went into shows with the mindset that their performance was an experience and that when you experience something, it changes you. And the way that he translated that to the stage performance was through his clothing. He would start the show wearing one thing, usually like layers, like a jacket or a scarf. I don't know what people wear to punk shows. <laughs> I don't know if I need to say that. I feel like that's obvious looking at who I am as a person. Anyway, uh, he'd start the show wearing all of this stuff, and then periodically as he went through the songs, he'd take the layers off. His hair would get messy. He would visibly change as he and the audience went through the experience of the show. And he and the audience would be different at the end than they were at the beginning. 
And when we started working together, he told me this story as a way to help me think about my content. I needed to think of my script as an experience and, metaphorically, <laughs> strip on stage. I need to think about where my audience is at the beginning of the video and then think about how I want them to change after having watched the video and then figure out how to get them there. This is what I did with my white trash food video. I started out with a little anecdote to set the scene, an anecdote that takes the viewer back hundreds of years. And then I start talking about modern diets, but I talk about them from a sort of detached, distanced perspective. And then I did a costume change and started talking about how this topic affects me personally. So I started with this really abstract, hypothetical thing, and then over the course of the video, I brought the viewer closer and closer until we were talking about individuals. This individual, specifically. But you don't have to actually literally do a costume change to get this effect. Dan Olson, the mind behind Folding Ideas, did this in his video In Search of a Flat Earth. But he also sort of goes in the opposite direction, where he starts with a specific lake and a specific experiment, and then it grows and grows and grows until he's talking about QAnon and how and why people believe conspiracies. It's really incredible. <laughs> Another incredible example that I love is Philosophy Tube's video, Data. In this video, Abby has a conversation with another character, and they discuss privacy and personal data, and not only does it have really eye-opening information, but it's also presented like… <laughs> you know how in video games, sometimes you're having a conversation with an NPC and you accidentally choose the mean dialogue option? So you quick load the previous save and start the conversation over so you can choose the nice one instead? Since we got the scanner, we've had fewer thefts. Club managers stealing tips and booking people for illegal shifts. If you want to investigate crimes, you're better off going after management. Since we got the scanner, we've had fewer thefts. 14 quid for a cocktail and you say it's not theft. Since we got the scanner, we've had fewer thefts. Yeah, unless you count the theft of our data. Oh! It's like that. This video follows the whole conversation, all the different branches of the dialogue tree, and through it, we are taken through all the different directions that the conversation could go. We see all of the rhetorical questions, and we see where certain points might take us. We see all the places where the conversation could end. I think that this is one of Philosophy Tube's best videos. It is so, so good. <laughs> anyway, this isn't a foolproof solution, and it can be hard to think of your factual educational content as a story. But stories help us absorb information, and it makes videos more enjoyable to watch, and it allows you to stretch some of those creative muscles that you might not always use when making other kinds of factual educational things. So now you have all of this important researchy stuff, but you want to make sure people actually understand what you're saying. Well, that's where step six comes in. Because it's one thing to have all of these great ideas, and it's another thing for people to actually get it. This step is about making it easier for people to get it without oversimplifying the content of your ideas. Do you not like me moving my arm? Is that why you're... <laughs> Look at this. <sighs> All right. I'm not doing another take of that. <laughs> First is analogies. And I like to think of analogies like salt because salt is the most basic and most vital food seasoning. The way salt works is pretty complicated, but basically it just makes everything taste better. Because salt suppresses our perception of bad flavors, which then actually increases our perception of good flavors. It essentially primes us for the good flavors of our food. You scratched my wrist and now it itches. Analogies are just like this. Analogies, or metaphors, or similes, all the ways that you can explain something by comparing it to something else, all of these things can prime our brains for the complex flavors of our main points. Now, you shouldn't overdo it. You know, I think we've all had those dishes where there's just way too much salt and then it becomes all you can taste and it's real gross. So don't lean too heavily on analogies, but in moderation, they can make your arguments so much better and easier to get. Another tool is examples. Now, I like to think of examples as the food network, because it's one thing to read a recipe, but sometimes we need to see a recipe get made. 
And seeing other people make a recipe can help us get an idea of what we need to do when we make the recipe. It's really helpful, especially for people who learn best by seeing things modeled. In this vein, you should also include examples in your video essays. I did that throughout this video when I brought up example videos for most of the points on this list, but just like watching a bunch of chefs doesn't actually make you a better chef, there is such a thing as too many examples. If all you have is examples, then you don't have any substance. So you need to make sure that you balance your stuff with the stuff of others. The final tool that I want to talk about is humor. And I like to think of humor like hot sauce. Or cayenne, or paprika, or red pepper flakes. Basically, it's spice. <laughs> like no, spicy no. spice. Because people's tolerances and tastes vary, and it's easy to have too much. And if you have too much, people just won't be able to watch your video. Or eat your dish. I don't remember what layer of metaphor I was on. And just like I am not very good at jokes, I also don't have a very high spice tolerance. I am very white. <laughs> but if you don't have any bite, even the smallest amount of black pepper at the very least, then your dish is going to feel like it's missing something, and people won't want to eat it or watch it. And if you, like me, struggle with outright humor, don't worry too much about being funny. Just try to be loose. Like, with, with the dance moves and everything. The moment that you try... <laughs> the moment that you tighten up and try to look all professional and humorous and... No, humorless! That's literally the opposite. <sighs> the moment that you tighten up and try to look all professional and humorless and like a very important person with a very serious question, people, paradoxically, aren't going to take you seriously. That's why I've tried to cultivate this atmosphere of coziness, because most of the time I talk about serious and academic things, but they don't have to feel serious and academic. The cat helps. <laughs> Step number seven is don't write like you're writing, write like you're talking. And this is something that I think might be a hot take or an unpopular opinion, but this is my video, I can say whatever I want, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> in the early days of ye olde internet, video essays were a new art form. We had people like Lindsay Ellis and Every Frame of Painting who were taking this platform that was known for sketches and flash animations and comedy songs and doing something revolutionary. They were making long-form educational content. And they thrived! The video essay as we know it was born, and people loved that style of content. Over the years, more folks popped up, and even today, especially with the pandemic, more people than ever are starting YouTube channels to talk about educational, critical, political, and artistic content. And most of what these people make is built on the foundations that these early pioneers created. But while we can and should borrow from the greats, we also need to accept that the genre of video essay is changing. What worked in ye olden days doesn't necessarily work now, and I don't think that that's just a shift in trends. I think that it's a honing of the genre. As we've grown and more and more people have thrown their hats into the virtual ring, we have figured out what works and what doesn't. As a collective, we've gotten a lot better at content creation. But Zoe! This is very bad for my voice right now. That's fine. For the content, baby. But Zoe! What does this have to do with writing advice? Is this the first time that you're seeing the arms for the butt Zoe's? <laughs> How many times do I have to do the butt Zoe? I think it's probably fine with the takes we have, so I'm gonna start with well. Well, dear viewer, Traditional video essayists, the first wave, as I call them, were trying to carve out a niche for themselves, and part of how they did that was by using language and style of academia. Basically, they used big words and spoke in a certain way, and their essays sounded like essays. And then comes in the second wave, where we have people like Big Joel and Philosophy Tube and Innuendo Studios, and they make video essays while bringing some life into the genre. Their essays don't sound like essays, they sound like a friend explaining something to you. A smart friend, a maybe pretentious friend, but a friend nonetheless. 
And I believe that this comes down 100% to the writing. Now, people who are currently making videos, people who are new to the scene, those of us in the third wave, we have the opportunity to shape the genre conventions of this new era for video essays. And I think that the trend we've seen so far, moving away from the language of academia and moving into a more casual conversational style, is the future of video essays. Casual language isn't just good for explanation, though it definitely is. It's a lot easier to understand things when it's explained in conversational language. But it's also good, good, better, but it's also better for the performance. When you read your script, and most video essays are scripted, this video itself is about writing scripts, you don't want to sound like a bored professor at an academic conference just reading out their paper from the podium. Nobody wants that. But writing in academic language lends itself to that boring style. Because what works in writing doesn't usually work in spoken language. Sentence structures that are great for essays can be awful for videos. Fragments? Not allowed to have that in essays. But they work great for videos. And grammar? Don't even get me started. <laughs> this isn't to say that you can't use any academic language. You can. I'm not the boss of you, you can do whatever you want. But if you are going to use complex language, I have one piece of advice. Make sure your words are precise. Don't use a turn of phrase that doesn't fit. Like, there was a video that I was watching the other day, and the person was talking about the app known as TikTok. And like, it's not known as TikTok, it is TikTok! Just say the app TikTok, or just TikTok. We all know what you're talking about. You don't need to phrase it like that. Anyway, just be precise in your language, please. <laughs> Pay attention to every word. Interrogate every single word. Make sure every word belongs, does something important, and isn't redundant. All right, English professors peel over. When you talk to a person, nope. When you talk like a person, when you talk to the camera the way you would talk to a friend, your content becomes a hundred times better. You're more approachable, less pretentious, more easily understood, more fun to listen to. So go ahead, put those ums and ahs and ellipses and italics in your script. Write in sentences that your English teacher would have hated. End with rhetorical questions and make little faces and just have fun. Because what is the point of doing all of this? if it isn't fun, right? Let the words flow out of your fingers the same way they come out of your mouth. Your fingers are your new mouth. <sighs> Don't write like you're writing. Write like you're talking. The final step, step number eight, is to remember the medium. You're writing a video essay for a reason, so keep that in mind while you're writing. This is also related to number seven, in that a lot of people write video essays the way that they write essay essays, but you're not writing an essay. You're writing a video essay. So what do I mean by remember the medium? Like, what is the real difference between a video essay and a regular essay? Well, video essays are time-based, whereas regular essays are more spatial or space-based. When people are reading things like essays, they can take their time, they can go back and reread things, they can skip ahead, they can compare two passages to each other, but videos are different. And this isn't to say that people can't change the playback speed of the video, or go back and watch a section, or skip forward. Obviously, they can do all of those things here on YouTube.com. But I just mean that writing is inherently a physical medium, whereas video is inherently a temporal or time-based medium. So whenever you want to phrase things spatially, like saying, as I mentioned above, instead you need to phrase things temporally, like as I mentioned earlier. Now this isn't like a total deal breaker. It's not like saying, as I mentioned above, is going to suddenly take someone out of the moment and make them leave your video and unsubscribe or anything. But I think that this specific problem represents a more general issue. 
Because, as the immortal Marshall McLuhan constantly reminds us from beyond the grave, the medium is the message. Which is just a nice little way of saying the medium, or the platform that you use to deliver a message, affects the content of whatever message is being filtered through that medium. A photograph of a goose and a 2D painting of a goose mean two very different things to you, even though they are of the same goose. If I were communicating only in audio, you would get something totally different from my videos than if I also included these visuals of my human husk that exists here in this accursed material world. So if you're choosing to use YouTube, a medium that is both sound and video based, a medium that is inherently temporal, then you need to take advantage of what is offered to you by this specific medium. Ask yourself why you're on YouTube. What do you want to get out of your channel? What do you want your viewers to get out of your videos? And what is it about YouTube specifically that allows you to do those things? Because maybe you could accomplish those things a lot easier on a different platform or with a different medium. Maybe your videos would work better as an audio-only podcast, or maybe they would work better as texts, like as essays or books, or maybe even just long Twitter threads. You can follow all of these steps that I've laid out, but if your content just isn't right for this platform, if your message gets too warped by the medium, then these tips and tricks just aren't going to help. Because they are tips for YouTube specifically. They're tips for making audiovisual content on an audiovisual platform for people who want to consume audiovisual stuff. Your mileage may vary. But if you are right for the platform, then these eight steps can help you become a pretty good video essayist. Probably. <laughs> There's lots of other moving parts that make this whole thing function, and let me know if you want me to talk more about all the stuff that goes into this stuff. <sighs> and like I said at the beginning, all of this should be taken with piles upon piles of salt. I am just one person making stuff here on the internet, and I am by no means an expert. However, I have been fairly successful in my own right, and so I just wanted to share what I think are some of the reasons that I got to where I am. Nothing is foolproof, and there is no easy route to success. But if your goal is to make well-written stuff, well, I can help with that. As I used to tell my students, helping people with writing is literally my job. It's just that my class size went from 25 to a, f a couple more than that. <laughs> but I do still love writing and teaching writing, and I will take any excuse to talk about writing-related stuff. Because with better writing comes better idea sharing. And if you want to be a video essayist, it's because you think that you have ideas that are worth sharing. So go ahead, share them, add your voice to the millions of other voices that are here, screaming into the void, desperately hoping that someone will listen to us. <sighs> Happy writing. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. If you want any more of these like writing tips or content creation tip stuff, be sure to let me know in the comments. And if you liked this video, be sure to like and comment and subscribe and ring the bell. And I think that's it. All the YouTube things. <laughs> This video was brought to you by my wonderful patrons and members whose names you can see scrolling over here. And if you want to join them, then go ahead and click the link in the description or hit the join button that is right beside the subscribe button. I want to give an extra special thanks to A Tasty Snack, Adam, Al Swigert, Dylan, Robert Bradford, and Science Punk Sellout. Thank you all so very much. And now we have our patron poem of the video for The Maiden of Stories. Here is turning. The woodcarver lays out her tools, chipping bits and chisels, bone smooth handled. Burl held in the lathe between artist and vision begins to spin, imperfections melting into rings. In expert hands, metal against wood, she presses. 
The chisel plucks and bites and eats, and slow and loud, the burl becomes something else only she can see, and emboldened, pushes deeper. In an absent-minded moment, mere minutes, it's gone. The burl strewn across the floor, wood chips made of potential that she sweeps away and burns. And until next time, stay safe, stay warm, and I will see y'all again soon, I hope. Bye, folks. Desmond, can we get some belly action? Can we get some belly action happening here? Woo! Woo! Look at this belly!